Dr. Vinay, thanks for doing this. You're as, very welcome. My as, pleasure. As we were talking about, um, and I'm going to just sec ask you just to, for, I'm also super curious, but also for the listener, just a little background. But as we were talking about earlier, this, as I have discovered, and then just watching, um, or reading the press and, 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 you know, of course, social media and, and talking to folks, this is a very complicated issue. You had an interesting, I won't bury the lead, but you had an interesting response to that, um, that we'll get into obviously over the next hour. Um, but before we do, um, just give, just give us a little, uh, obviously you're French, which is, is, I remember the first time we, we, uh, we talked and you, you, you talked about growing up in Paris and having a, a summer home and, and watching the tour. So I thought that was cool. Of course we have, you know, uh, just a couple of weeks until the tour de France, but just how do you end up, uh, uh, you know, from <clears throat> growing up in Paris to sitting here in Los Angeles? Uh, yeah, I was born in Paris and I did all my medical studies in Paris and, uh, I sort of almost fell into this field of, uh, sex variations. I, I did my very first rotation as a medical student, uh, in, uh, Hôpital Necker, a children's hospital in Paris, um, in, a um, clinical service that was a. European center for, of reference for, uh, kids born with, uh, an intersex condition, meaning that it was, uh, unclear if they were boys or girls. And at the time it was very rudimentary and there were lots of decisions made on their behalf that hmm. I kept asking myself, why do people know what's going to happen to these children? So I ended up becoming passionate about it. I did a PhD in the field of sex determination at the Pasteur Institute and then moved um, to UCLA, uh, University of California, Los Angeles, where I became a, a faculty member, a professor <coughs> of uh, human genetics and pediatrics and, and then uh, remained in this field for, for a long time a long until time. now. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you we met through uh, Roger Pilkey, who's who's also part of this series. Somebody I've known for a very long time. He he speaks very highly of you. Um, you, you know, and, and this issue of of sort of uh, sex um, at a very young age. I mean, we obviously we're talking about chromosomes, right? When you were from the very beginning of your studies or research. I mean, this is not a, a, a an optical question. This is a question of chromosomes, chromosomal differences? Well, sex is actually a bit more complicated than that in the biological sense. Yes, chromosomes is the main thing mm -hmm. in sport right. that has been historically the major factor. But um, of course, you could look at it with other parameters. You could say sex is levels of testosterone. Right. If it's high, it's male. Biological, biologically speaking, if it's low, it's female. You can talk about production of uh, sperm versus eggs. Hmm. So you can have many, many different uh, definitions. In most cases, all these definitions sort of aligned. They, they are, they're all in the, in, kind of in the same, uh, in the same box. But for a growing number of people, that's not the case. Right. So right, which is the reason. Mm -hmm. We are where we are. That's right. I, I think as as um, as a society, but certainly on this issue, when it comes to sports, which then of course is a, is a very slippery slope because then that slides into politics, that slides into bathrooms, that slides into you know uh, a lot of other things, and so it gets it gets very very complicated. But I think most folks, I mean, you said it, uh, uh, sperm or eggs, right? A lot of folks. You know, I don't, I don't know about in Europe, but, but, or the rest of the world, but you know, a lot of folks in the United States, it kind of comes down to that, right? If you say, okay, Dr. Belan, how do you, how do you know you're a man? Right. And of course there's other stuff out there and, and, and Matt Walsh did a, I thought a very interesting documentary, you know, what is a woman, right? I don't know if you had a chance to see that, but he asked a lot of people, especially in the transgender community of, you know, what is a woman, right? It's a fair question, right? I mean, it was an interesting way to go about it, but most people, it, it comes down to that question. Right. You, you know, in the, in the world of sports, interestingly, the answer to this question was 
very reductionist in a sense and coming down to chromosomes for decades uh, since the uh, 60s until the late 90s mm -hmm. um, the sports of authorities have declared that to be eligible in women's competition in other words what is the definition of a woman in sports is basically uh, not having a Y chromosome. And that was the case for many, many years. And, and you, you, you may know this story that women have had for many years to uh, carry this card, mm. uh, sort of, um, you know, a gender identity, a gender gender card mm -hmm. and and there was a lot of confusion because in fact it was not this had nothing to do with gender it was all about the sex. biological sex mm -hmm. and uh and and this card uh was obtained after a a chromosome test was done so initially it was sort of an indirect way of looking at chromosomes it was called bar bodies they were counting the number of x chromosomes after that they were looking at the Y chromosome or a gene called SRY. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that it, at the end of the mm -hmm. day, it was whether um, these uh, women athletes had a Y chromosome. And if they did, they could not have the card. And, and if they didn't, they, did, they could have the, the card that gave us the right to be eligible uh, in, in women's competition. Mm -hmm. And there was a famous case in the mid 80s, 1983 originally, which was the case of Maria Patino, a Spanish hurdler champion, 100 meters. And she obtained her card uh, in 1983. She competed uh, as a woman uh, with her card um, uh, in, in, in world championships. And... Uh, <laughs> There is this story in which uh, in 1985, as she's invited to go and compete in uh, Japan, in Kobe, for uh, the World University Games, where she realizes that she has forgotten her card and <laughs> uh, in the plane. And then she goes to see the coach, her coach, who says, don't worry, you know, the, the uh, Japanese authorities will just redo the test. And they redo the test and... Uh, um, she basically is told that she cannot compete, uh, and, uh, that the reason is that she was found, quote, not to be eligible as a woman, not to be really a woman. Hmm. And it was absolutely devastating for her. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, uh, they suggested that she faked an injury and there is this, moment in which she's uh, looking at her at her teammates compete and she's crying which would fit with the uh, injury narrative except she's crying because she's confused and and mm. and she doesn't understand what's going on and she became a good friend of mine mm. and uh, instead of sort of receding in the background she's really the first woman athlete to fought back the sports authorities and became uh this uh this uh um basically flag bearer of yeah, athletes pioneer, going back yeah, pioneer yeah. And, and the reason is that wh why there was this confusion right. is that those tests uh are, are at the time were not perfect of course. you know and uh and so it was a, it was a screen and the initial screen um turned out not to see a Y chromosome. Um, she, she, uh, and if she did the test today? She, if she did the test today, uh, it would show that she has a Y chromosome and she's not uh, shy to say that. Right. Uh, but uh, if you see her, if you listen to her, uh, she uh, is, she feels like a woman. She's always uh, um, presented, as, presented a as a woman. And uh She's very proud to be a woman. Yeah. You know, the, the stuff like this is so, um, it, it is complicated that, 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 you know, stories like that, but it's, it, th this is, I think for most people is very gray. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, you know, if you generalize the, the, the subject and we, and I really want to get into some of the science and, and more nuance of it, but if you generalize it, most people 
And, and I, and I, and I have, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I have been in this camp. I, I, through this process, I, I feel like I've learned a lot more, but most people just say, you know, I don't, when you were born, did your mom and dad did say you were a girl, you had a, a, a vagina and, and, and characteristics of a girl and, and you were a boy or vice versa. Um, and that's it. And so, uh, you know, the doctor and your parents, doctor declared you a girl and your parents raised you as a girl. And so you're a girl. So for the rest of your life, uh, and, and vice versa, as a, as a, you were a boy, you have a penis. Um, and so you're a boy and you're going to, if you ever want to compete, and then of course it gets right. even muddier because you know, com- what is competing, right? Competing is, you know, right. on the, on the, on the middle school, uh, the intramural soccer team versus an Olympic medal, a Wimbledon final, you know, a rainbow Jersey, a tour de France, you know, th- this, it, it's, a, But as you know, being said, uh, you're a girl at birth and you're being raised as a girl, uh, clearly is not enough from sports authorities perspective. Uh, most famous example being Castro Semenya, mm-hmm. um, famous, uh, world and Olympic champion of 800 meters who was born as a girl, raised as a girl, uh, but then, um, discovered after her win in 2009, uh, in the Berlin world championship that, uh, um, she, uh, was suspected, uh, not to have the right biological right. characteristics, right uh, for, for a girl, for a girl. And then, uh, you know, there was this, uh, uh, infamous quote by, by then IAAF, uh, secretary general saying, uh, um, uh, that Castro was not quote one hundred percent woman, hmm. um, but if you look at her upbringing, um, there is nothing that she even suspected that right. she was not a girl. But th- but that is, I mean, n- now you know, and Castro's example, and Roger uh, has written a lot about this and and speaks a lot about it, and it was really a passion project. It you know has testified on her behalf a lot of things. I mean, that is now we're talking about a very, very small percentage uh, of, of occurrence. Right. I mean, it's 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 very, very rare on, you know, whereas now we find ourselves, of course, it's hard not to talk about the two together. But now you are talking about, you know, what most would say, hey, you're a biological male, which, by the way, is you're not supposed to say. Right. This thing has gotten so politicized. And so and, and, you know, and of course, really, the root of this conversation for me was why is nobody even willing to talk about it? Everybody's afraid to talk about this issue. So and people are afraid to say biological male. What what the fuck? That, what's so wrong with that? But but that's people, you know, that that's a cancelable um, offense. And and so but but but. You know, so that they do get mingled, but here we are. You know, of course, we all know the examples: Leah Thomas and uh, Austin Killips, and even going back, you know, Renee Richards. And um, this, this is is a is a very hot topic. Well, the the reason why talking about quote biological males or biological female can be problematic is because at the individual level, what matters is their own gender identity right now. And, and I think that's the most important, uh, from a sports authorities perspective, um, they want to sort of reduce, uh, sex characteristics in the perspective of sports only to a very simple parameter. And for a long time, that was the Y chromosome. And now they've shifted to testosterone, right. the male hormone. And now, you know, some federations are saying, well, it doesn't even matter right. what the what the biological parameter is. We're just going to ban um, participation to sports uh, of, of trans athletes and uh, an intersex athlete. And this evolution of, uh, first of all, changing the kind of parameters that is taken in account from chromosomes to hormones. And then for hormones, Mm. it went from different levels, 
10 nanomole per liter as a threshold uh, above which a woman could not compete, then it was five, then it was 2.5. Right. And then in some sports, it's zero. Hmm. I mean, it's just, it doesn't matter. And it, it bugs me because all these policies that change with time relatively rapidly uh, in, in, in a few years, the policies do, are not supported by any kind of new scientific data that are coming up. They're just policy that seems, at least on the surface, in response to um, social events, political, right. political uh, feelings, etc. Yeah. And not, they're not based on science. But at the same time, the sports authorities keep maintaining that, oh, absolutely, it is based on the strongest possible science, and we follow the science. Right. Sebastian Coe, uh, who is the president of World Athletics, says, we will follow the science. And I've always argued, great, let's just do it. Mm. But he also says, uh, and I have it here in this article, you know, he, he says, it was the, the quote, um, gender cannot trump biology, is what Sebastian Goh said. So he basically said, we're going to choose fairness over inclusion, I think was another quote. But in English, we call that whack-a-mole. You know what whack-a-mole is? Yes. So, you know, and, and for those, God forbid, nobody listening to this show not know what whack-a-mole is, but you know, you go to the state fair and you're like, <laughs> you keep popping its head up. That's whack-a-mole, right? And, and as somebody that's, uh, you know, I love science and I'm, and I love being around people that know science, right? So if, if, if I don't know, I just look at all the smart people and I say, all the scientists say, okay, well, what's, you tell me, because whatever you all say, I'm going to, I'm going to agree with, because I just don't know. But in this case, it just seems that there's for as hot as this this uh, topic is and as polarizing as this topic is, there's not a lot of science. There's not the definitive science, right? You would think on this issue they would say, okay, this is it. You know, we've done you know the the study of all studies, and this is the definitive ruling. Right. So there is a lot of science about differences between males and females in uh, performance. Which is what we're... I mean, well, which that's is, not exactly what we're talking about. Right. But it's... it's y y yes, know, yes and no. So, yes and no. So, there is... So, uh, there is a lot of science about differences of, in muscle mass between uh, males and females. Um, and uh, the differences between testosterone levels, differences mm -hmm. between red blood cell counts, which mm -hmm. carries the oxygen to mm -hmm. the muscle. Of course. There's a lot of science there. There is, and I agree with you, very little science about uh, real life performance of trans athletes. Mm. How do trans athletes perform in real competition uh, compared to other athletes, cis women athletes, for example. And the problem is, is outright bans will produce the obvious result that we will never have these, uh, uh, these kinds of data. Mm. Uh, so proponents of bans basically come from a point of view saying, oh, we have all the data. This is science because we look at differences between males and females. And in athletics, for example, we know there is somewhere between 10 and 12% 10 to 12%. of uh, better performance yeah, same as women. Depend, uh, in males, for, uh, men versus women. And therefore that's enough because um, trans women in their words, uh, is basically equivalent, similar, the same as, um, as men. And my problem with this is that's not the case. Uh, because they've gone through the therapy well, and, and exactly. They've, so, you, you, you know, so for example, reducing levels of testosterone 
will immediately reduce the the number of red blood cells. Right. So, but it doesn't erase, you know, and and I want to just reiterate, you know, the examples that we use on these shows are the examples that the world uses. So nobody is getting isolated or or, or singled out or picked on. But when you look at, you know, the case of Leah Thomas, I mean, uh, clearly had some benefits of having spent. I don't know, 90% of her life as, as a, as a boy, as a male and, and as a young man, the size, the strength, the, there is a residual. Yeah. You, I mean, I, I, I guess there is a residual benefit of, of having lived that life. I mean, one would say, and maybe I, and again, okay, let me just rephrase it. You know, one would say, right. That, 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 that there's been this, um, the, this built effect of having been a, a strong young man. That's what one would say. And, and a year of, of, of uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, et cetera, um, you still get the benefit, one would say. And the problem is you present it as if it's so much of common sense mm -hmm. that right. no one is going to argue against that. Right. And uh, I, I don't think it is that obvious. Mm. For first of all, uh, Leah Thomas, uh, she won the 500 yards, uh, but she didn't. Uh, she was fifth, I think, in the right. 200. She didn't. It was, I think she swam the, the, the 200, uh, uh, the 500, and the 1650, the mile. So the, the one she won, which of right. course is the one that so, got all the attention. The real question is, is being a trans athlete giving the athlete such an overwhelming advantage, insurmountable, as one could say, mm -hmm. that all the other advantages that are enjoyed by elite athletes are becoming negligible mm -hmm. in the face of being a trans athlete. Because if that was the case, that would say, okay, yes, there is something that is so powerful of being a trans athlete that it dwarfs everything else. It dwarfs having access to the best trainers, mm -hmm. having access to the best nutrition, having access to the best equipment. The best equipment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, you know, having access to the right geography. But I think one assumes that at the highest level, and again, we, you can break this down and talk about the very, very elite, which I think is, you know, where my brain automatically goes, or you can talk about youth sports and that's a, really a whole different thing. It's still an issue for a lot of people, but you know, if we focus on elite sport, one, you know, would, would tend to think that, you know, if you're an elite athlete, if you're at a, at a big university or you're a, a professional, that everybody sort of has access to this. Well, you can say that to Caster Semenya mm. because, uh, you know, she didn't and many other African athletes. Uh, but um, there is this notion that of level playing field that I've never fully understood mm. when it's thrown at uh, as an argument as we need to make sure that everything is leveled. Uh, and in sports, that is certainly not the case. So you could say everyone has access to the best everything, nutrition, etc. Now, of course, the genetics are going to be different from one athlete to another. There is going to be different body characteristics that are going to make some athletes better at one sport and, or, or, and worse at others, mm -hmm. you know, the body of a marathon runner is very different. Well, the example you meter. gave me when we talked about the, the, you know, the uh, Singapore sends athletes to the winter games at, as does Norway. Exactly. Right. And Norway wins, I don't know, a, a 50 gold medals and 150 in total. And Singapore has never won, never won one, one medal. Never won one Winter Olympics. And they have about 5 million people, just like Norway, and their socioeconomic status and the access of all these athletes to everything is 
is just as good as Norway. So this is not level playing field. But now when we come to participation of trans athletes, somehow there should be this one exception in which trans athletes must be, no matter what, at, you know, we, we have to try to uh, make them uh, sort of at, at a level playing field. I think it's it's a little bit of a double standard as, mm. as if it was, uh, I think the assumption is that they have this superpower of being trans that will make them win everything. First of all, I certainly have not seen that. Uh, trans athletes are not dominating all competitions. Mm -hmm. The other thing is this notion of having an insurmountable advantage. I, which I don't think there is evidence that trans athletes do have, but I, I want to give you this example of uh, just uh, champion athletes uh, that do have, in my opinion, what could be considered as an insurmountable advantage. So I'll take the example of Usain Bolt. Mm -hmm. Usain Bolt in uh, 2009, and I, pick this example because that's the same world championships where Castro Semenya mm -hmm. was, was challenged as not being, um, you know, uh, not having fairly won. Usain won the 200 meters and I calculated that by three, he, he was, he sped faster than the second one by 3%. He won. You calculate the difference. It's 3%. Castro wow. won by 2%. Okay. To me, one could say if you're living in the, if you're a, uh, an, a 100 meter, 200 meter athlete mm -hmm. and Usain Bolt is there, you have no chance. Right. If you're in the decade. <laughs> I agree. Of, well, but do, if you agree, then do you agree that uh, no, I mean, I agree, I agree that I would have no chance. It, well, exactly. <laughs> but, but then we, one, in my opinion, would have to agree that we are not trying to make a Saint Bolt sort of at the same level playing field as everyone. Mm. We're not saying, oh, well, this is really unfair. He's winning by so much. There must be something that he has, which he does, of course that makes it unbeatable mm -hmm. during the time where he's at his prime. Everyone says, this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. We're going to celebrate the talent, the natural abilities, all what makes these athletes incredible. We're not saying, well, that's unfair. We need to just make sure that, you know, we're going to have categories to make sure that, I don't know, we're going to have, um, you know, different, mm -hmm. different categories to make sure that everyone is sort of starts with, uh, with, with, with this at the same level or with the same handicap. Okay. So let me just, let's, let's stay on Hussein Bolt. How old is Hussein Bolt now? I mean, he must be for early forties, 40, yeah. 40, early forties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then let's just, just to play devil's advocate for a second, you know, and, and I don't know who Sam Bolt, I, you know, uh, uh, but you know, let's imagine you and me wake up tomorrow morning and Hussein Bolt does an interview and says, uh, uh, I have gender dysphoria and I, I've decided that I'm going to transition. Um, and, and I still, and I, and I miss competing. So Hussein Bolt, it's going to be uh, Michelle Bolt or whatever, you know, she decides to be and does everything that, 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 that is, is, uh, you know, the rules, there's a whole nother issue about how we prove that, you know, the, because WADA, as we, as you know, and we know what WADA and USADA don't want to touch this issue, but Michelle Bolt says, I'm going to go, I'm going to have the, the, you know, go through the therapy for 12 months and, and, and I miss competing. What do we do then? Because then she's going to win by a lot more than three percent. Well, we don't know that. We, we have, I know we don't know. You but, know. but you know, it, that's. But and again, that's the the the. That is the the you know because. You know, I, I, like I said, I don't think this is ever going to happen. But that if that did, if you're just you know playing hypotheticals, that's where people say, well, that's not fair. 
Right. So um, that's the issue is um, to basically pick examples that would be uh, sort of portrayed as so unfair that so much common sense. How can you agree that they would be fair? Mm -hmm. And we're doing thought experiments and thought right. experiments are great, but they're just not real. Right. So, and, and one, you know, we're taking one imaginary example that right. I can, I can give you, you know, real life examples right. of uh, Laurel Herbert, who the New Zealand uh, weightlifter, who everyone was worried that, right. uh, Couldn't lift anything. Uh, that, she would she would win everything and then she didn't lift anything. Right, right. Well, why, why isn't you, you know? And it's just as bad of an example of saying, "Oh, well, Leah Thomas won this one thing." It's not how science operates. Right. We don't operate and saying, "Ooh, this looks so unfair. Everything must be unfair." Right. Um, the new rule of World Athletics that basically bans transgender women. Uh, to participate in the in the women's category, um, according to World Athletics, uh, it says that it will impact exactly zero women competing yeah, I think in World makes, Athletics. Right. So, but however, it will impact, if I recall, seventeen uh, women with an intersex condition. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that a little later if you want, but. So I, I, I find it interesting that we have a role that impacts no one. So why do we have a role? I mean, if it's such a danger right. that trans women are going to win everything, well, then there should be dozens of them, right? Suddenly right. eliminated right. because of this. And that's, and that's, and that's what the, the, the advocacy uh, the community, uh, 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 the, you know, the, the trans community would say is like, you know, and I think using the New Zealand powerlifter, I mean, that was the one athlete from the last Olympics, I believe. So I think it's like 0.001%. But what is real, right? That's a real number, but what is real? And I think this is what people, um, for better or worse, uh, think is, is just this fear that, that as, and again, then you start to get in this issue of society and how the, you know, uh, to, to textbooks, to bathrooms, you know, people, you know, are seeing this wave. And so people are saying, wait a minute. Okay, fine. There's you said the right word fear, right? It's fear. It's fear of not understanding. It's fear of something that, but also fear that maybe people, there's none now, but, and, and it doesn't have to be, when is the next, the next Olympic games, by the way, congratulations is in, is in Paris, uh, 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 next, golly, I'm losing my, my next summer. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be Paris 2024, you know, it could be Olympic games, um, you know, somewhere 2036 and it's the hundred meter dash or it's, it's uh, Wimbledon final in 2030, you know, it's. You know, that's what people I think are trying. And again, I'm not I'm, I'm trying to be as neutral on this as possible. But if I could imagine they're trying to get ahead of this, even though the numbers are zero, let's call them zero now. You know, it could be the women's tour de France and certainly less time than uh, I, I think most other sports. These are the and this has always been my view to, to the community is like, hey, um, because then I think people will react, right? If, but if, okay. if I may, you're saying I'm trying to be as neutral as possible. But by saying what you said, ooh, there is the possibility. Can you imagine in 2024, 2028, right. suddenly we're going to have all the podiums filled with trans athletes? I, I don't think you don't it's helpful in the conversation because, first of all, Clearly, it cannot happen right. because the exclusion has uh, the exclusionary policy has won for now. And when I say, "Can you imagine?" Uh, what I'm I'm not again. I'm trying to speak from a neutral. I'm saying I think people and you know the population or, 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 or the the consensus will be wait time out. What did we do now? You know what I think on this, or you know, it, it, I'm try, I, I keep out of it. But I, I do think if I had to imagine what society would think, I think people would say time out. 
And I'm not sure that you're right. Oh, good. And, and, because, and this is why... Because society is actually changing much more than, uh, you know, what we, I don't know, maybe see in a polarized world of American television. Yeah. You know, there are many <laughs> big countries, uh, Olympic countries, Germany, New Zealand, Australia, they, they allow a, a, a non-binary uh, gender on the passport. That's coming. There will be elite athletes who have an X on there and, and not an M or not an F, but mm -hmm. an X or, mm. or, or, or some other variation of that. That's mm. neither male or female on their passport. They're going to go and try to compete at the Olympics or the world championship. What, so, so, so what, what are the sports authorities going to say? Mm. Are they going to say, oh, well, we know we have like this one, this one uh, um, biological parameter. Oh, but wait a minute. We've actually now removed, we've, we're banning trans. And they're like, well, I'm not trans. I'm just, I want to declare no gender. So society, when you say, oh, people will say, well, time out. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There are more and more young, you know, young people who would not agree with that statement. Well, they, may, I, they may say, oh, that's great. Right. And, and, and look, the, the numbers won't lie there. I mean, in, in the, the younger generation, it, this is a much more fluid topic, right? And uh, whether it's their personal choice or their view of other people's personal choices, which, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're just a couple old guys sitting around now. What, now what I find, I mean, we are having a conversation about this and, and, you know, we can go back and forth and, you know, agree on a lot of things and not agree on something, but th th this is, uh, you know, obviously become just such a hot topic, but let's go back. I, I want to go back to the science. Right. And again, cause this is just the way my simple brain works. Cause I just don't know. Right. I can, why isn't that? I mean, shouldn't there be, or, or maybe somebody is working on this, some sort of the, you know, the, the be all end all scientific verdict on this. Cause I, I, I do think, you know, the international federations, the national federations, the, 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 the organizers, the promoters, the sponsors, et cetera, all the stakeholders would follow that. That's right. And they, in my opinion, you're absolutely right. They should invest in scientific inquiries about what is happening. Is, is there a parameter, a biological uh, test that actually we can say, oh, that is really important to, uh, um, to know, to actually say, well, you know, that would be uh, so overwhelming of an advantage if this parameter is above this. So there were, there were attempts to do that uh, in real life. And by real life, again, I mean, because that's important. I mean, in real competition, uh, there was an attempt to do that by uh, uh, the time IAAF, now World, World Athletics, to try to see if there was a correlation between levels of testosterone, the male hormone, and performance by women in a world championship. And they did that. There was the Daegu in uh, South Korea championship. And um, they did find a correlation for a handful of events in which they could say that being in the, the, the top uh, third of, uh, of performers uh, was correlated with being in the top third of, uh, of, of levels of testosterone. Mm -hmm. And that was true statistically for 400 meters, 400 meters hurdle, 800 meters, hammer throw, and pole vault. And I'm thinking, oh, this is great. Notwithstanding the fact that there were methodological issues with this paper that Roger, that you had on this, on this show, uh, pointed out that there were problems and mm -hmm. policy should not be made after just one unreplicated papers. Of course. But policy was made looking at this one paper, but interestingly, the logical policy that should have been okay, we're going to uh, basically say that testosterone levels are important and should be a reason to um, not make women eligible if their testosterone is above a certain threshold in these sports. 
The policy did not follow that. They followed it for 400 meters, 400 meters hurdles, 800 meters. Pole they pole. added 1,500 meters and the mile, which were not in the article, and they removed pole vault mm. and hammer throw. Why? There's very simple reasons. And, and uh, I know that because of just conversations with, with uh, sports authorities who said, we didn't have a case of intersex or trans athlete uh, in hammer throw and pole vault who would be in a winnable position. Mm -hmm. So we removed them. This is better. It's more inclusive. But we did in 1500 meters. So we included them. And that's not following the science. Right. That is just saying, we don't want mm -hmm. athletes who are trans or intersex mm -hmm. at all in a winnable position. So we're going to make sure that the policy just adapts to that. We just don't want them. Mm -hmm. So we're going to say the policy kind of follows sort of the science. But if you look in the details, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the result is... They're just, uh, they're just excluded. Yeah. And that is a typical example of policy first and then trying to find a justification with some science. What, let me ask you, that's fascinating, but I, I, I just had this thought um, because we're, we're talking about these, these, the testosterone levels that are now, you know, let's call it more or less this, this sort of this general standard of 2.5. Um, for, for, for a year, which of course, you know, taking testosterone blockers or estrogen, of course, the other option is, uh, is full on gender reconstruction or, or, um, or, you know, with the, I'm, I'm messing up the words, I should know these things by now, but the, you know, basically a sex change, right? So, you know, well, thank God we, that, you know, sex change, as you say, so. So what my question gender is what affirming happens, surgery gender affirming surgery has no uh, uh, and should not have any impact on performance. No, but what happened? I'm saying if and I'm just curious, I'm not because uh, I don't know the answer to this. Um, for example, Caitlyn Jenner has had gender affirming surgery, right? I'm, I'm, I'm from what all I hear. Leah Thomas has not. Right. What happens to. Uh, uh, to the body and to, to, to these, the, the, the issues of testosterone levels, et cetera, after that surgery, did you then not need the, uh, the, the estrogen and the blockers? Well, it, it, it depends what surgery we're talking about. Like the, but the, if the there real is, surgery, the full the, surgery. But if there is a surgery that, that the gonadal, removes the, right. that, that's, that includes a gonadectomy, right. obviously the levels of testosterone are going to drop. Right. I would think. Uh, well, <laughs> it's absolutely certain. They're actually going to drop to levels that are uh, even lower um, than, uh, than, a woman. than cis women. Right. Because in women, testosterone levels are made roughly 50% produced by the adrenals and 50% by the ovary. Uh, so here there is not the, uh, the, the part of the ovary. So, so, Y yes, these levels are going to go down, but maybe we can go back to the to the the, the science issue of yeah. of saying, okay, y y we're looking at all these levels and we're making policy uh, based on these levels of testosterone. And if there were data, I would be on board with it. What strikes me as particularly strange now as the levels have gone the threshold levels 10, from 10 5, 2.5 2.5 now we can say okay 2.5 that's a very interesting number because as it turns out roughly a typical woman cis woman will have levels of testosterone somewhere between 0.6 and 2.4 2.5 So 2.5 mm. is right at the upper range of normal for a cis woman. Mm. And, and just by the way, you know, just to give you a, a sense, for men, you jump to 10, which is the lower range, to 35 nanomole. So there's a big gap. But 2.5 now, it says, well, if you're above 2.5, you cannot compete as a woman. 
What people don't realize is that's not exactly true. You cannot compete as a woman if you have 2.5 or more testosterone and you have a Y chromosome. In other words, mm -hmm. the rule for world athletics does not apply to women with two X chromosomes, cis women, uh, who would have, uh, you know, it's just a statistical curve. There will be a significant number of women that will be above the, the range. There is a condition and a hormonal condition called PCOS. That's stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome, very common condition in women. Many athletes have this condition. Their levels of testosterone is going to be above 2.5. It's going to be 2.8, 3, 3.2. Will these women be um, declared ineligible by sports authorities? Absolutely not. Mm. So now we're in this situation in which we're made to be believing that a testosterone above 2.5 is unfair if there is a Y chromosome, but it's fair if there is no Y chromosome. And I'm still waiting for the science justifying that. Right. Well, look, I mean, and again, having spent the trip out here yesterday, reading through this, the, the, the you know, the IOC's uh, framework on fairness, inclusion, and uh, et cetera. Uh, which it says a lot, but really at the end of it all, it kind of says nothing, which is... Well, I, I, I don't fully agree with that. Mm. I think it says that, uh, first of all... It's very political. If, well, it, it's it's about principles. I, I don't know if you can call it political. I, it's, it's, it's a principled document. Mm. It says uh, that inclusion uh, is paramount, that... Uh, we sh that every federation should make every effort to include rather mm -hmm. than exclude. So mm -hmm. inclusion should be the baseline. Right. And then it says, right. if you're going to exclude, right. then it needs to be evidence-based. Yep. So you need to produce the science. Yep. And you also need to compare, if you're going to do testing, you need to compare what's comparable. Meaning you, you're going to need to compare with the same, I think it uses the word, uh, the same athletic engagement. In other words, you can't take people who are not athletes and do the science on this. Right. And you cannot compare uh, males, uh, so men to women right. to exclude trans women. Right. You're going to need to compare trans women to cis women. Exactly. But, well, exactly. Except do they of, do that? None of that is there. None of, they, none of the federations actually right. do that. Inter so the the IOC produces principles and say, if you want to exclude, here is what you need to do. And we leave you, the federations, uh, the the autonomy to do that. And one could say, well, IOC just, and there is part of it that's true. IOC, it's, it's, it's an easy way to say uh, they're not going to police anything and take any responsibility. But I would say on the other hand, they actually say they recognize that each sport is different and um uh, you know there, there there may be in some sports uh, where trans athletes uh, b being trans will will really uh, maybe even more even hurt you may, maybe hurt you right, exactly right, right. so so you, you, you know now what's interesting it's it's become a patchwork of rules uh because each federation comes up with their own limit or no right, limit so right. world athletics says uh, and uh, says it's trans trans athletes are banned and interest for intersex athletes is 2.5 right. uh, FINA for swimming says uh, it's banned uh, UCI for cycling uh, says it's 2.5 yep. so can I, can none I just of this none of this is based on on any actual uh, data analysis let me make this more confusing for the listener because right, you're talking about kind of the big sport, the big Olympic sports, right? You're running, cycling, swimming, uh, you know, track and field, et cetera. But the, it, it, here in the framework from the IOC, they give another example. This, this, this will really fuck up the listeners. I promise you. Um, it says uh, useful data relevant to defining disproportionate advantage come from both the individual athlete and the wider athlete population. In the case of Australian rules football, 
Okay. So now we're talking about something. I don't even think it's an Olympic sport, but they use this. It's, it's not, but it's, right. it's, but it's interesting it's, because it's a team I, sport. I think it's very interesting, mm-hmm. right? So this mm-hmm. is, you know, we're talking about sort of the nuance of this. Uh, of, so, for example, Australian Football League's elite transgender eligibility policy includes an assessment of trans athletes' height, weight, bench press, and squat capabilities, their 20-meter sprint time, their vertical jump, game-specific GPS data, and the two-kilometer runtime, and then we'll evaluate it. I mean, that's pretty nuanced, Right. That's a different. I mean, I mean, I think so to your it's, point, it's, it's all over the place. But that's so. So uh, it it appears. I, I did not know about this, but it appears that they are trying to um, take the word disproportionate right. uh, at at heart and say, well, let's let's look at what you can do, mm-hmm. and then we'll see if if uh, what your physical abilities are truly disproportionate. Assuming that they're disproportionate because this particular athlete is trans, which I still have an issue with because there could be a very, very gifted athlete who happen to be trans. And what makes this athlete win may not be because they are trans. It may be because they're just really, really good athletes. Well, that's just an example. You know? I mean, I thought that was, and I, and I, you know, obviously highlighted that. I thought, wow, this is, I mean, we're now using G- G- GPS data. I mean, obviously the bench press and the, and the vertical jump and the 20 meters. Sprint. Got it. I mean, we're going down to GPS. I mean, that, that's a very, very sort of nuanced but, new age. Well, uh, it, it is, although there is a problem with that. So if we go back to Usain Bolt, it's as if we would say, oh, well, we're going to measure all what people can do. And if it's really too much, we're just going to investigate mm-hmm. why is Usain Bolt so good? And we're going to put everyone under a microscope and say, if you really have a disproportionate advantage, then you can compete. Now, of course, no one would watch sports. Hmm. elite sports, if uh, we were all in a situation where we want to level the chances of everyone. It's like saying we're going to show on TV uh, basketball games in which is going to be middle-aged, five feet, eight people. You and me playing. Exactly. (laughs) And be like, oh, great, let's just play. That would be be level playing field. And nobody will watch it. And nobody is interested in sports like this. Everyone is interested in seeing LeBron just crush right. everyone else. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. I, I, I don't think it's that complicated. I know. That's what you told me before when we first because, got here. I said, well, this is such a complicated well, issue. The, and you said, this, I don't think it's that complicated. I mean, I, uh, you're... Sp- you, uh, you, you're unique. I mean, you're, this is what you do. And, but I, 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 it is complicated for most people. Now you have not complicated. If you follow the science, you know, let's just, let's just say, you know, we're saying, Oh, it's unfair. Well, prove to me that it's unfair. Right. And then if it is, then, then sure, I'll, I'll agree with you, but don't tell me, Oh, it's complicated. There is all these societal forces and et cetera. Yes, there is, there is, but, but, at the sports level, yeah. it does not have to be complicated. Now, of course, sport doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in society and there are societal pressures. I understand that. I'm right. just trying to make it simpler by saying, okay, if you're going to exclude, exclude with cause, with exclude with, with reason, facts. Right. with facts. Right. And right now you're excluding uh, in a way that will prevent facts to be um, delivered. So mm. we'll never know. And I think that's, it's a tragedy. Yeah. That's, those are, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one, 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 uh, 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 one could say, well, let's just, uh, just, just time out until we know, right? But what I guess I'm hearing you say is we cannot time out until we know because then we won't know. Right, so you can time out. So you could have, exactly, because because you, you can never time out anything in, in society. Things, you know, the show always goes on. So what you could do is uh, um, find ways to include. You could have uh, 
uh, mixed events. Well, open, they, 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 open they, events. They don't like that. I mean, the trans community doesn't like that. Well, I've tried, I proposed that, and they, I got destroyed on that. They don't you, like that. You, but that doesn't. You you could have a variety of options. Yeah. You know, how long would it take? Oh, let's talk about it. Now we're talking about knowing. We're talking about fact. We're talking about educating people that just have no clue, like me. Um, how long? Like, if you if, let's just say you had the perfect study. How long, and you had willing participants and the best scientists and researchers, how long would that take? You know, y you can never know exactly, but I would say a full season would probably... A year, so we could provide, call it a, a yeah. year. You know? and, and, and as the IOC says in the framework here, so we need research. We just need somebody else to pay for it. Right. So the IOC says we need research. They've yeah. always said we need research. Yeah. Uh, I... Uh, I'm a big advocate for research and I would challenge the IOC, World Athletics, all the big federations to actually set aside resources and they have quite a bit of resources. Right. And this was Roger's view is that, 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 that that's to actually how, however we split this, this up. Yeah. And, it, and have, have uh, open requests for applications for scientific projects yep. with an independent body that will evaluate them and let's just uh, let, let's just do this approach now it's not just about money it's also about access mm -hmm. access to athletes so mm -hmm. you could say oh yeah yeah we're going to do the research and then when it comes to actually um measuring um i don't know levels of testosterone do 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 we, will researchers have access to it mm -hmm. or will the world athletics say no nope, off limits you know, who will do the consent? Will the consent be, be done properly mm -hmm. for the athletes to participate? Mm -hmm. uh, can we do surveys of athletes so uh, and know what they think? Uh, it's, uh, Which, of course, USA Cycling just tried to do, I think, mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw this, this, this uh, story, but a month ago, they did a survey with, their, with you know, not every, not, I mean, there's probably... I don't know, 100,000 members, let's just say, but they went to sort of, they had sort of handpicked, you know, the, sort of the elite and, and sent out this uh, <laughs> survey, which wasn't very, uh, it wasn't very secure. Uh, and then, you know, they got a lot of shit for that. And, and it was, you know, the survey got leaked, as you can imagine. And, and so that was unfortunate. IOC says, to this end, it is critical that sports stakeholders and major funding bodies outside of sport direct funds towards research innovation in this space. Here, here. Right, but then, you know. But uh, I'm still waiting to see when I, those exactly. uh, pilot uh, right. projects funds are going to materialize. Yeah. But sure, I think that's, it's certainly part of the, uh, part of the solution. Yeah. Uh, and that's at the, yeah. For the elite athletes, it's absolutely crucial to have this. Yeah. See, it's not that complicated. I told you. <laughs> Dr. Villan, thank you so much. I don't want to You're take too much welcome. of your time. This is, this is, yeah, this is good. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.